here to all of our hearts. Uh, before we start, uh, I think it's important that we have the committee uh, briefly uh, introduce themselves, uh, their name, and of course where they're from. And we also have a couple new uh, committee staff that we'll need to introduce. And we'll start, um, and we also have a couple of uh, visitors at the table here too. First, we'll start with our um, committee members. Um, and we'll start right over here with uh, Senator Weger, the minority lead. Thank you, Madam Chair. My name's Chuck Wigger, and I'm the minority lead. Uh, my home is in Maplewood. I represent several communities in the East Metro suburban area. State Senator Paul Anderson, representing Plymouth, Minnetonka, and Woodland. State Senator Justin Eichhorn, District 5, Grand Rapids, Bemidji, Itasca, Cass, and Beltrami. I'm trained. <laughs> I'm Representative Dean Erdahl and uh, just here because I have done some bills on civics. Thank you. Um, and then um, Senator Jasinski. Uh, Senator John Jasinski from District 24, Faribault, Otano, Asika, as well as the Minnesota Academies are in my district. I'm Patricia Torres Ray and I represent uh, Minneapolis, Southeast Minneapolis, and Richfield in the Minnesota Senate. So thank you. Good afternoon, Senator Greg Clausen, serving the communities of Apple Valley, Rosemont, Northeast Lakeville, and Coates. Representative Sandra Erickson, I represent a part of rural Minnesota and uh, am the majority, uh, minority lead, excuse me, in education policy in the House. Thank you. And, and I'm Senator Carla Nelson. I live in Rochester, represent Rochester, Chatfield, Dover, Yoda, Stewartville, 14 of Olmstead County's townships. And I'd also like to have our staff introduce themselves, please. If we could start with uh, Mr. Marcus. Hi, my name is Greg Marcus. I am the committee administrator for this committee. Uh, Emery Lewis, Senate Counsel for the committee. Ed Cook, uh, Republican Research. Jillian Reynolds, E12, CLA. Betsy Gelseth, the analyst for the committee. Uh, Jenna Hofer, fiscal analyst for the committee. Dana Elling, Senate DFL Research. Thank you so much. And we have a special warm welcome for Betsy. It's her first uh, E12 committee. So um, as many of you know, Minnesota's social studies standards include the direction to teach about citizenship. And since 2016, state statute 120B.02 requires that high school students take the civics exam before graduating. That's already current law. So currently, there's a three points about that that I think are important for you to know. Districts are not required to record a student's score on his or her transcript nor can a student be denied a diploma for failing to answer 30 out of 50 questions correctly. That would be a passing score, 30 out of 50. Personally, I think that's a bit of a low bar, but that's where we are. Uh, school districts are not required to keep records or report scores to the Minnesota Department of Education. So we don't really know how our students are doing on this very important topic of civics, something that prepares them to be active participants in our rep representative democracy. So today we're going to hear from a slate of experts who have studied this, who have worked in our state, uh, and who know our students, to testify to the fact that the long-term success and future prosperity of our state and our country demand that students understand civics. That's why we're here today. The very strength of our state is in the balance of our future citizens. They must understand civics. Now we're going to have a variety of speakers. You'll see your names, those who have notified us that they'd like to testify on the agenda. Uh, we do have a number of speakers and a short amount of time, a finite amount of time. And so I'm going to ask that you try and limit your comments uh, to three minutes. And in order to allow as much time as possible 
for your cogent comments. I'm going to ask the first three people to come up to the testifying table so we can begin. That would be Justice Paul Anderson, Secretary of State Steve Simon, and Steve Young. If you three could come up to the table. And just a note, a couple housekeeping details here. It's important that you sign uh, the guest log at the testifying table as soon as you uh, get there so we know who is testifying. Another rule in the uh, Senate is, of course, as I call, all comments go through the chair here. And as you're called upon to testify, the number one thing is to say your name uh, and uh, before you uh, testify. Um, and then, as because we want to keep as much time for comments, uh, when you see a vacant chair up there of those three chairs, I would like you, if you're the next person on the list, to just come on up to that chair, and I will recognize you in order. So with that, I would like to welcome Justice Paul Anderson. Welcome to the committee, Justice Anderson. Please introduce yourself for the record. Uh, Paul H. Anderson, retired uh, justice on the Minnesota Supreme Court. Madam Chair, members of the committee, I am going to ask your indulgence for a few seconds to begin with. This will be the first time I've ever had the opportunity to appear for a committee where Senator Paul Anderson is here. And I do apologize for any burden that you have to endure because of the legacy I've left. I mean, I, I, I know that I know there is some penalty that you paid because of what I have, but anyway, I apologize for any legacy you have to endure because of we share the same name. Okay, to begin with. Justice Anderson. In our, my business, the need for this, we call it a prima facie case. Democracy in our country is under threat. I'm 76 and a half years old, and this is a time in my life where I feel that democracy is threatened more than I have ever seen it. And uh, so it's legislation you need. Now, it's feel-good type legislation, okay? Kind of, you know, fuzzy, good, embracing stuff. That's what people will tell you. It isn't. There's an absolute need for this in society. I know that. I've been in the schools and have talked about it. You're going to have a lot of people with different agendas tell you why it can't be done. They're going to, you know, you gotta, and you've got to think deep. You've got to go deep on the reasons. They'll come up with technicalities. They'll say, can't do it, do that. No, you've got to keep your eye on the donut, not the hole here. We are in a democracy, as Franklin said. He's given you a republic, my lady, if you can keep it. This is part of keeping the democracy and the republic that was given to us. Now, I am very sympathetic to you on this because the devil is in the details. You got to do it right. Because once you do it, there will be people who can figure out their way to get around it. There will be people out there, both Republican, Democrat, and others, that will take it and try to use it for their own advantage. And you got to do it right so that you get the end objective that you want. And so, just, we need it, prima facie case, do your job, get it right, and why should we do that? Let's go, I, I was telling the chair that the, my last page is in color because I want you to look at it. I'll I believe everyone Jefferson. has a copy. But I'll end with Jefferson. I know no safe depository of the ultimate powers of society but for people themselves. If we think them not enlightened enough to exercise their control with a wholesome discretion, the remedy is not to take the vote away from them. And there are people who want to take the vote away. No, but to inform their discretion by education. Ladies and gentlemen, I rest my case. Thank you, Justice Anderson. Uh, good words from the justice and from our founding fathers. Thank you. Next on our agenda, we have uh, Secretary of State Steve Simon. Welcome to the committee. Introduce yourself for the record, please. Thank you, uh, members and Madam Chair. Steve Simon, Minnesota Secretary of State. Thanks for the opportunity. Um, it's my honor to support this effort to move the ball forward on civics education in Minnesota. Um, I like to say I'm in the democracy business, so it's no surprise that I come at this from the standpoint of voting as one species of civic engagement. Um, and, you know, voting is a right, yes. It's also a civic duty. 
Minnesotans know and understand that. We're number one in the country, last two elections in a row for voting. And in the last election cycle, in 2018, we were not only number one in the country for voting, we were number one in the country for 18 to 29-year-olds as well. This is good news. I want to make sure you speak right into the mic sure. so everyone can hear that. Secretary I'll repeat, uh, in the 2018 election, Minnesota wasn't just number one in the country overall. We were number one in the country for 18 to 29-year-olds as well. But we know we have a lot more work to do. The percentage of that age category that voted in Minnesota was about 43 percent. That was good enough to be number one in the country. But as we all know, that's not good enough. We can do better. There are a lot of things that account for youth voting everywhere, not just in Minnesota. One is family habits and traditions. Um, young people who have accompanied a parent or a guardian or someone in their life to a polling place or whose parents or family members vote are more likely to vote and get involved that way. Then there's the idea of getting good habits started early in the school. Uh, our office um, created something called the, uh, uh, well, it was basically the first ever mock election for high school students in Minnesota. We're now working with uh, others who you'll hear from uh, in the next election on that effort as well. But then there's another missing ingredient, and that's the ingredient that all of you can help to provide over the coming years, which is robust, um, testable civic education in schools, not just high schools, I would argue, but going down to elementary schools, so that those who will be our future voters and participants and the drivers of the ship will understand what it is they're voting for. I don't mean what in terms of political parties or candidates, but really what it is they're voting for. When they're voting for a particular office, what does that office do or not do? And I think that's a very special and important ingredient. So thanks for your time and attention. If for no other reason, and there are many other reasons, um, creating a future with engaged young voters is very important to all of us. Thanks so much. Thank you, Secretary Simon. Steve Young. Members, Welcome to Madam the committee. Chair, thank you so much. We meet while our federal Senate is debating whether or not to impeach our president for high crimes and misdemeanors. That, members, Madam Chair, is heavy-duty civics. By coincidence, in 1974, I kind of stepped up to look into the history of high crimes and misdemeanors in English parliamentary practice, as discussed in the Constitutional Convention of 1787. My conclusions ended up in the Articles of Impeachment of Richard Nixon, in this language. In his conduct of the Office of President of the United States, Richard M. Nixon, contrary to his oath, faithfully to execute the office. The concept, members and Madam Chair, is fundamentally one of citizenship and good character of the United States. In all of this, Richard M. Nixon has acted in a manner contrary to his trust as president and subversive of constitutional government. Who do we trust to be our citizens and to be our leaders? Um, for those of you who might be interested, I brought a copy of my 1975 Law Review article with the footnotes. Again, in April 1975, I also kind of stood up and triggered the resettlement of refugees from South Vietnam. I would not have the honor of my country stained with betrayal of those who fought in common cause with us for the good of humanity. Then in 1978, I was part of the Citizens Commission on Indo-Chinese Refugees, which successfully persuaded the Carter administration to open up this country to the boat people, the Hmong, the Lao from Laos, and the Khmer survivors of the killing field. Why did I do this? I'm not entirely sure. I think it was out of a sense of fidelity. My ancestors had stood up for this country. Winthrop Young swore the association oath in April 1775 to oppose with arms the operations of his majesty's armies in the North American colonies. On my mother's side, Lewis Morris signed the Declaration of Independence and his half-brother governor wrote the preamble to our federal constitution. My dad and my uncle served in World War II. Later, dad assisted President Eisenhower in pledging assistance to the people of South Vietnam in seeking independence from both France and communism. Now, with respect to our topic today, a Rubicon has been crossed in the history of our republic. I think Justice Anderson spoke to that. And I do not refer to any Gaius Julius Caesar with his legions. I refer to a collapse of social and human capitals to be academic. We have lost the ability to trust one another. 
Republicans don't trust Democrats. Democrats don't trust Republicans. Independents don't trust either. Men don't trust women. Women don't trust men. Parents are wary of their children. Children ignore their parents. Teachers are defensive. Students are disrespectful. Families are dysfunctional. Religion is in decline. Only 3% of Americans today in polls say they can trust the government in Washington to do what is right all the time. Only 14% of Americans trust the federal government to do what is right most of the time. Ladies and gentlemen, how can you run a republic in a democracy when 80% of your people don't trust the government? I will skip over some of the surveys, but I think you should all look them up as to who Americans trust. We trust the military, 74%. We trust Congress 11% of us. Trust is basic for social and human capitals. It is social and human capitals which create other capitals, financial, institutional, cultural. Social and human capitals are the foundation for human prosperity, well-being, and justice. For 20 years now, a cancer has been eating away at our formation of robust social and human capitals, the internet and social media. The digital age is an age of cultural decline. Today, young Minnesotans are mostly educated to become persons by social media. Parents, churches, and schools are failures in raising our children. Our republic is in peril as a result. Consider, 73% of Americans under age 30 believe that people just look out for themselves most of the time. 71% believe that most people will try to take advantage of you if they get a chance. And 60% say that most people can't be trusted. But for baby boomers in the older generation, like some of us in this room, only 30% of us believe that people can't be trusted, which means 70% of us believe we can trust people. Social media has been linked to higher levels of loneliness, envy, anxiety, depression, narcissism, and decreased social skills, as well as a new, relatively new psychological condition, I am told, FOMO, which is fear of missing out. What you need to address in your consideration of civics, members and Madam Chair, is how do you offset the deleterious effects of social media with our youth? May I suggest your only tool is our public schools and your insistence that they become expert in the teaching of civics and good citizenship. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you, Mr. Young. Um, and if I could have our next uh, testifiers come up, uh, Don Samuels and Thomas. And I've got the imam here. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Um, imam Hassan. Welcome to the committee. If you could kindly introduce yourself for the record, please. My name is Imam Hassan Jama, and I'm the executive director of IANA, Islamic Association of North America. Thank you very much. Welcome to the committee. Give us your remarks, and I will tell you the microphones are not very hot, so be sure you speak right into the mic, please. Sure. We try and have about three to four minutes per testifier. Mom. Madam Chair and members of the Minnesota Senate, as I mentioned, IANA, our organization, is an association that supports 34 mosques and Islamic centers all over the United States. Our mosques primarily serve the Somali American community. Dear members of the Senate, first, I would like to thank you for inviting me to speak at this hearing today. Secondly, the Somali Minnesotans recognize and appreciate the important, important work you have done and continue to work on to make Minnesota and this nation a better place. Minnesota has become home to a thriving population of Somali immigrants. Today, Somali Americans are in almost every sector of Minnesota's workforce. The community's strong entrepreneurship and the welcoming efforts of the resident in this state has formed a major part of their success in Minnesotans. Let me thank you as a representative of the people of Minnesota for all that Minnesotans and Minnesota, Minnesota and Minnesotans have done to help fully for new Americans from Somalia. We are grateful. 
We are Somali Americans who want to become not only good Americans, but the best of Americans. We hope to forge a path and to succeed as Americans, just as previous immigrants from England, Scotland, Ireland, Italy, Germany, Sweden, Norway, Poland, Ukraine, China, Laos, Vietnam, Cambodia, Mexico have done over the generations. As a Muslim Somali American, our identity is shaped by our religion, our culture, and our citizenship. Islam has always encouraged us to respect and honor the constitution of whatever we reside. Our Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, made covenants with the Christian communities, pledging for himself and his followers respect and protection until the end of the time. I quote from his covenant with the monastery of St. Catherine in Sinai. <coughs> Whenever Christian monks, devotees, and pilgrims gather together, whether in a mountain or valley or dean or frequented place or plain or church or in houses of worship, fairly we are at the back of them and shall protect them and their properties and their moralities by myself, by my friends, and by my assistants, for, the, for they are of my subject and under my protection. It's positively incumbent upon every one of the followers of Islam not contradict or disobey this until day of resurrection and the end of the world. We hope to instill in our children and grandchildren and future generation what it, is, what it means to be loyal, hardworking, caring citizens of the United States. We want them to show in their character appreciation for the opportunities offered by this country and its people to us and to all other Americans. However, as a Somali imam is speaking on behalf of Somali parents, we need the help of our public schools as a parent. Many of us do not know the American history all that well. We have not had the opportunity to study the Declaration of Independence or the Constitution in depth. We do not know much about sacrifices and wars America's, American took part in order to build this nation. We are not familiar with the moving speeches of George Washington, Abraham Lincoln, Franklin Roosevelt, John Kennedy, Martin Luther King Jr., uh, Humphrey of Minnesota. Therefore, we are not able to com competently teach our children to understand what it means to be an American citizen. We need the help of public schools in Minnesota to adequately teach our children and grandchildren civics the rights and duties of citizens, the, the ideals and high standards which bind us all as Americans. Finally, our scripture, the Quran teaches us to have faith and do good work. Thus, all people should not take worst but the best as their standards for living as God's stewards. Our children and grandchildren need to learn the best of American aspiration, and our public schools are the place to teach them these lessons. Thank you for the opportunity again. Uh, thank you, Imam. Welcome to the committee, ma'am. Introduce yourself for the record, please. Um, good afternoon. My name is Kajo Kong Ta. Um, I'm here representing Hmong American Partnership and Community School of Excellence. <coughs> Go ahead, please uh, present your okay. comments for the committee. Um, good afternoon, Madam Chairs and member of the Senate. Um, I, as I shared earlier, I'm on behalf of Hmong American Partnership, HAP, and CSC Community School of Excellence. At Community School of Excellence, I am the Chief Administration Officer, and I'm here to share with you sort of my personal testimony of what I've actually experienced and the importance of have, making sure that we have um, a, a 
job and education so that our students become good citizens uh, and engaging citizens um, in the United States. Uh, the schools that I'm at are the school that, that uh, Hmong American Partnership oversee. We have over 3,000 3, students. And in the population in the Hmong community in Minnesota, we're looking at over 90,000 uh, Hmong that are, in, uh, that are uh, in Minnesota here. Our families are in a Hmong community have a very strong desire for their children and for their grandchildren and great-grandchildren to become good American citizens. And for the elders and parents needs help from the public schools to achieve this goal. An example of this, I'm a former refugee child from Laos. I came to this country, my parents didn't speak a word of English, but my parents believe, and my father fought for the United States. They, uh, he was a veteran, he's a former veteran. And what, he, what I remember growing up is that he said, you need to make sure that the country that has given you, that have supported us, make sure that you continue to give to the country. And I've done that so. I, I'm very fortunate, I'm, I'm actually a product of St. Paul Public School, and being able to, and again, my favorite subject of, is government and social study. With that, never thinking my, in my wildest dream that one day I would actually run for elective official uh, or office. And I did that, and I ran for public school, uh, St. Paul Public School, and I won a seat. I became the chair, and I'm really excited that to be able to serve um, it, um, two terms, eight and eight years. And I would not have been able to do that if I didn't get the education. Now imagine if we were able to continue to provide that education and more students are able to get that kind of quality education and be able to understand and be able to engage. I can also share with you the impact of being engaged in um, uh, and being civically engaged. My family, because I was engaged in, the, in running for offices and understanding, I couldn't imagine myself ever being able to do that. But I believe that quality education is so important and every child deserves a quality education. And it also it's important for, our, for that our families are also understanding. They understand the, civic, the, the process itself and that, that they're engaged. What I want to also quickly share with you is that my since deceased grandmother, she's 100 years old, but since she was 100 years old and when she deceased. But when I started running for, when I ran for school board, she was very excited about the process. She didn't understand, you know, how, what does it mean and can I be, you know, and she became a citizen and she, in her 80s, and she's been, you know, for the last 20 years, she's been voting every single, she didn't want to miss an election. And she was so excited when she, you know, she loved uh, President Obama, so I shared that with you. So for, for me, I wanted to share with you that it's so important to make sure that we get this kind of education in our system because the student, it's people like me in my community, we're be really benefiting from this. And I believe that many of other communities are able to benefit from this if you were able to provide. And again, if this is an example, and I appreciate um, this opportunity. Thank you for your comments and congratulations on your election to the school board. Uh, it's critically important. So thank you for your leadership there. I think we have Mr. Samuels uh, at the table next. And uh, then if I could have the next two people come on up to the table as well, that'd be John Adams uh, and Bill Green. Mr. Samuels, welcome to the committee. Introduce you, yourself Chair. for the record, please. Madam Chair, I'm, my name is Don Samuels, and uh, I am a resident of North Minneapolis, where I served as a council member for three terms in the fifth board there, and a member of the school board for one term. And um, I, I come to you as a great opportunity to share my views on the importance of civics education, especially in, in addressing the achievement gap. Uh, in August of uh, 1962, I was a high school student in Jamaica. Um, that was six years before, eight years before I left for the United States. And um, it was also one year before uh, Martin Luther King's great speech uh, in Washington. And I heard the speech in my backyard, and I've forgotten a lot of my civics from my Jamaican high school, but I never forgot that civics lesson. And uh, Martin Luther King in it said, in a sense, we've come to our nation's capital to cash a check. When the architects of our republic wrote the magnificent words of the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence, they were signing a promissory note to which every American was to fall ear. This note was a promise that all men, yes, black men as well as white men, would be guaranteed the unalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It is obvious today that the America has defaulted on this promissory note. 
insofar as her citizens of color are concerned. Instead of honoring this sacred obligation, America has given the Negro people a bad check, a check which has come back marked insufficient funds. I'm sure we are all impressed by those eloquent words and the sentiments of them, Madam Chair. And I would dare to suggest that Martin Luther King um, might have good a math, been a good math student. He might have been a good reading and writing student. We know that for sure. And he was a great orator. But I would suggest that the fire in his belly was not driven by those skills. The fire in his belly was driven by his knowledge of his rights and his responsibilities as a citizen of the United States of America and of the documents which guaranteed him his rights. That's what drove him and inspired him. Ironically, today, and gradually since that day, after fair housing laws were passed and our Northside community became integrated and our ethnic enclaves became diversified and we had white flight and then black middle class flight and people pooling again, repooling in, uh, in suburbs and uh, uh, co suburban communities along class lines. And now people being left behind in my community along class lines. And we have a concentration of all of the gaps, the educational gap, the home ownership gap, etc. Ironically, the achievement of the civil rights movement to guarantee the movement of people at their own will also created these pockets of poverty and desperation. And also a gap of knowledge of rights and a sense of belonging. And so, strangely enough, we've come full circle in communities like mine. Young people in schools feeling like they do not belong in that school, feeling like they do not belong in our country. They don't belong driving a car down the street. There's only one solution for that. The same motivation that drove Martin Luther King to write these eloquent words and rise up and claim his rights can inspire another generation of young people to rise up and take a hold of their full citizenship as Americans. We cannot abandon this priority and we must put it equal with the other subjects that children are learning, these subjects that guarantee their technical skills we must also insert in them the fire in the belly that comes with the knowledge of their civics, their human rights and responsibilities as citizens of the United States. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Samuels. Um, I believe next we have Thomas, Thomas Kao, C-A-O, President of the Vietnamese Community of Minnesota. Do I see Thomas? Okay, well, we will come back to Thomas. Um, and then we have um, John Adams. Madam Chair, thank there you. There is a patriotic name. Very good. I'm a lot older than I look. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Madam Chair, member of the committee, I'm John Adams. I live in South Minneapolis. I retired 10 years ago from the University of Minnesota where for 40 years I taught urban geography, urban studies, and urban and regional planning. I was chair of the geography department several times and also was the head of the Humphrey Institute in the 1970s. I specialize in capitalist cities in the United States and also taught courses on socialist cities in Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union. Thank you for meeting with us today to discuss the unfortunate state of civics education in our schools at all levels. We all remember Jay Leno interviewing young people on the street who couldn't list the three branches of the federal government. Well, when it comes to state and local government, they know even less. For many years, I taught a year-long course on American cities covering population, housing, land use, transportation, how cities and metro areas emerged, how they work, how they interact with other places, domestically and internationally, how cities are governed, and how state and local fiscal systems work. I also taught a continuing, evening, continuing education evening course on the geography of the Twin Cities addressing the same topics for our local area. 
In that class, I used an overhead transparency of my own property tax statement with identifiers re removed. I projected it on the screen and then down the list of different taxes owed, describing and discussing each taxing jurisdiction, city, county, school district, metro council, special districts, special assessments. On the same topic in my American Cities course with 50 or more juniors, seniors, and graduate students from public affairs and planning, I wrote a large T on the blackboard, and above it I write city X. On the left side I wrote revenues, on the right side I write expenditures. Then I'd ask the class, okay folks, where do cities get their money? Dead silence. I coax them, repeat the question, more silence. Then I'd start calling them individually since I had a seating chart and knew all their names, Mary. Bill, where do, cities get the, where do cities get their money? Eventually, someone would suggest in a hesitant, weak voice, taxes? Yes, what kind of taxes? More silence. Well, eventually, like pulling teeth, I'd list the city's revenue sources, property taxes, license fees, parking fees, fines, rents, sales, intergovernmental revenues, bond sales, assessments. They furiously were taking notes. It was all new to them. Then I do the same for counties, about which they knew even less. When I, well, I'll skip this part, we're short of time. As far as I know, I was the only person at the U who taught this material. It's seldom, if ever, taught in high schools, and I doubt that our social studies teachers are often trained to teach it. It's rarely taught in colleges. Political scientists and economists consider this to be a trivial topic and we wonder why young people fail to vote in local elections. Uh, one time I was asked to substitute for teaching a seminar for urban studies students and I decided to talk about state and local public finance. I'd ask each student to go out, contact their county board, pick out a representative, city council, talk to a representative, and ask them to interview that council member, or county commissioner, asking them to discuss the board's debates over revenues and expenditures. I assured them that most of their elected representatives are happy to talk to a student or a constituent, and they kind of steeled up their courage and went and talked to them and we came back to the class all excited. One kid, when I'm given the assignment, said, boy, this is really interesting. I said, well, why is it interesting? He said, my mom is the budget director of Egan and I've never talked with her about her work. <laughs> so as far as I said, um, close this off, I was the only person who taught this subject. A, a few months before I retired 10 years ago, I convened a group of about 15 political science, de-economists, applied economists, geographers, planner, per professors, and asked them, what are we gonna do about the fact that we do not teach state and local Public finance, we do not teach how the economies of regions and cities work. As far as I knew in that group, they all kind of looked at their shoes and looked at their watches and conceded that I was correct, this was not being taught. As far as I know, out of 3,200 professors at the University of Minnesota, I was the only one who taught this stuff. I think that's a tragedy. And this is even worse at the high school level because the kids from high schools were in my classes, all from over Minnesota, they did not know the answers to these basic questions. So I commend you for picking up on this topic. I hope that we do something about it because the situation is really bad and as several other speakers have already spoken, if we don't know how our government works, if we don't know our part in what we do to pay the taxes, to receive the benefits, we're really in big trouble. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Adams. Uh, Bill Green, welcome to the committee. Uh, before you uh, introduce, before you start your testimony, if we could have Will Cooley and Kevin Lindsay come up. Uh, Mr. Green. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senators and Representative, uh, for making this time dealing with this issue. Uh, I would echo everything I've heard so far. I suppose that's a reason for me to leave, but uh, I just want to add two things. Uh, that I don't think that it's enough to just teach kids the mechanics of governance. I think that's important. I think that's critical that they be taught that, um, that adults be taught that. But I also think that in the process of talking about the governance of uh, the mechanics of governance that we also encourage young people to learn how to talk to people with different opinions. Use that as an opportunity for people with different positions, different perspectives to share, share their views and to, and to listen, to have their views listened to. Um, the other thing that I think is important is that through the process of learning the mechanics of governance and talking to each other, we, we revive the reverence that we once had, at least I once had, 
I still have for, uh, for government itself, that that's an important place. And it's probably one of the few, if not only places where, where uh, we can come and, 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 and address issues for all of us where no one is left behind in effect. So I think that those are two additional elements uh, that should be considered as you, as you move forward on consideration about what civics education should look like. Thank you. Thank, thank you, uh, Mr. Green. Uh, Will Cooley, welcome to the committee. Introduce yourself for the record, please. Madam Chair, members of the committee, my name is Will Cooley. I've been a college history instructor for nearly 20 years. I'd like to begin my testimony on the importance of civics education by referencing a song that nearly all of my students know, the Zach Brown Band's Chicken Fried. The song starts out with the usual modern country music themes, drinking, girls, and nostalgia. In the middle of the song, however, a military drum cadence begins, followed by these lyrics. I thank God for my life and the stars and stripes. May freedom forever fly, let it ring. Salute the ones who died, the ones that give their lives so we don't have to sacrifice. All the things we love, like our chicken fried and cold beer on a Friday night, a pair of jeans that fit just right, and the radio up. These lyrics distill a fundamental disconnect in American life. The troops are over there, sacrificing, sometimes making the ultimate sacrifice. We are over here, drinking, eating, and wearing tight jeans. When I ask my students what it means to be an American, they nearly unanimously uh, state freedom. Follow-up questions usually do not produce robust discussions. What about obligation, responsibility, service? No, many reply, that is what the troops do. They serve to protect our freedoms here. American soldiers are stationed in 150 countries around the world, including Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria, and Kenya, where a serviceman and two Defense Department contractors were killed in an attack in January that barely made the news cycle. We assert that these men and women are protecting our freedoms in these missions, but are they? Instead of critically discussing our overseas commitments, citizens speak in cliches such as support the troops and engage in gauzy military worship at sporting events. As one veteran noted, thank you for your service has become a way of saying, I haven't thought about any of this. We need a reinvigorated civics education not only in our schools but in our daily life. We need to ask the hard questions and think deeply about the many aspects of being an American besides freedom. In college level history classes, it is frustrating when students cannot identify the three branches of government, even though they've almost always say that they've memorized them and were tested on them at some point in high school. But they didn't grapple with these institutions or ask why they exist. It's not adequate to mandate a certain amount of time to be spent on civics or just a test. Let's encourage quality instead of quantity to assist in producing an engaged citizenry. Critical thinking is much harder to assess than a multiple choice test. Yet this extra step is totally worth it because our republic demands critical thinkers. In my years teaching, many business leaders have asserted that what we need is more job readiness in education. This is myopic. The free market that business leaders extol is reliant on the rule of law, an essential value that students come to understand in their civics classes. Job readiness will not go far if a nation's economy is defined by bribery, nepotism, government favors, and the arrests of political opponents. So I have four broad uh, recommendations. One, we need quality exercises that empower students to be capable, capable citizens. We can start by investing time and energy into professional development for civics educators. Two, we need to protect teachers when they wade into controversial discussions. A notable chill in the acceptable bounds of discourse happened after 9-11. One study found that almost 80% of social studies classes do not even discuss social problems and controversial issues. Uh, no wonder so many of my students say their social studies classes were boring if we avoid all the controversial issues. Three, the duty to foster so citizenship does not fall on one class, one test, or on teachers alone. Teachers need help from organizations outside schools that develop meaningful civic educational experiences. Education is an ongoing experience that does not end at education at graduation, rather. For to be an American means much more than freedom. As a society, let's stress all the other aspects of citizenship. Let's emphasize the responsibilities that come with this identification. 
I'll conclude with a story informed by my civics education, which was robust, that I gained in classrooms, as well as having a grandfather who served as a tank driver in World War II, a father who was an infantry medic in Vietnam, and a cousin who led soldiers in Kosovo and Iraq. A few years back, I was at the airport. A young serviceman headed for Afghanistan was saying goodbye to his mother. He held it together for her, but on the jetway, the tears started to flow. This was a good reminder for me. In a democracy with citizen so soldiers, his well-being is my responsibility. We should not be sending him in harm's way unless we can look him straight in the eye and tell him exactly what victory looks like. We need to dispense with the cliches and ask the hard questions. We can begin this process with a renaissance in civics education. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Lindsay, uh, before you start, if we could get Pahu Hoffman and Lisa Larson to come on up. Mr. Lindsay, welcome to the committee. Introduce yourself for the record, please. Welcome, Madam Chair and members of the committee. My name is Kevin Lindsay, and I have the privilege of leading the Minnesota Humanities Center as its Chief Executive Officer. Thank you for this opportunity. I appear today to encourage you to uplift the importance of civic education, share information about the state of civics knowledge in our society, and identify some best practices in civic education instruction. Uh, the Minnesota Humanities Center is a nonprofit organization that uses the disciplines of the humanities to convene and connect people to realize a vision of a just society that's curious, connected, and compassionate. While this, loss, this list is not exhaustive, the humanities disciplines are broad and include some of the topics that we have discussed from your previous speakers, like literature, comparative religion, history, jurisprudence, philosophy, and of course, civics. The Minnesota Humanities is an affiliate of the National Endowment for the Humanities. The NEH enabling legislation provides in part that our democracy demands wisdom and vision from its citizens. We collaborate with the NEH, educational institutions, and other organizations to promote civic education through community discussions, documentaries, and collaborative traveling exhibits. As Thomas Jefferson said, if a nation expects to be ignorant and free in a state of civilization, it expects what never was and what never will be. The humanity seeks to partner to ensure that we do not get to that point. The 2015 survey conducted by the Annenberg Public Policy Center for the University of Pennsylvania found the following. 31% of Americans could name just one branch of government, of the three branches of government. 32% uh, could not identify a sit the sitting vice president or one Supreme Court justice. These are troubling statistics. Chief Justice Roberts, speaking to the federal judiciary in 2019, said the following, we have come to take democracy for granted, and civic education has fallen by the wayside. In our age, when social media can instantly spread rumor and false information on a grand scale, the public's need to understand our government and the protection it provides is ever more vital. If we need more civic education, what are some of the best practices we should consider? Civic learning should put students at the center and should include both learning and practice not just rote memorization of names, dates, and processes. Civics education advocates, such as former Secretary Arne Duncan and retired Supreme Court Justice Sandra Day O'Connor, are advocating together that we move toward action civics, in which students are active participants in their learning. Similar to the previous uh, testifier, we should be incorporating current, local, national, and international events into our classroom discussions so that it is relevant to students, so they can perceive and understand the importance to their lives. We should also provide more opportunities to be engaged, for students to be engaged with community service projects connected to the civics education curriculum. We should encourage students to participate in, so, in school government and extra, extracurricular activities in their schools and in their communities that involve shared decision-making processes. We need to show them how to model to work together across communities and differences. Civics education should encourage simulations of democratic processes and procedures 
to allow students to gain more practical understanding of our, citizen, of our systems. I was uh, reminded earlier testifier talking about not understanding sort of finance. In my prior capacity as a commissioner of human rights, one of the things that I worked on was seeking to have the state agencies be more involved in sharing information about how they resolve complex or difficult questions. It was fascinating to me how little understanding the broader society had about how city and state and federal government all interacted. This is vitally important. We can't solve problems if we don't know how the system works. Finally, best practice. Civics education should include discussions of democratic themes of justice, freedom, and equality. Students should understand that in some societies, there is no assumption that leaders are chosen by the people, that people have rights, that leaders peacefully relinquish power after elections, and that government can be freely criticized or that trials must be fair. We should not take these things for granted that people just know these things. Let me conclude my remarks by quoting again Chief Justice Roberts, again from last year's conference. Civics education, like all education, is a continuing enterprise and conversation. Each generation has an obligation to pass on to the next, not only a fully functioning government responsive to the needs of the people, but the tools to understand and to improve that government. Madam Chair and members of the committee, thank you very much for holding this information in here, informational hearing on the state of civics education. The need is clear. We need more civics education. Let us all therefore be willing to fulfill our joint obligation to the next generation to ensure that all citizens have the tools to understand, improve, and continue to build upon the more perfect union. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lindsay. Uh, Pahu, welcome to the committee. Introduce yourself for the tape, please. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. For the record, my name is Pahu Yang Hoffman. I'm the Executive Director of the Citizens League, and I'm going to attempt to bring up my PowerPoint. It's hard to be the first one here. Thank you, Ms. Hoffman. Thank you. Before I start my presentation, I want to um, first just say that I've never been proud to be an American when my parents and I passed the naturalization exam. And so I really hold that example as one of the first uh, things that led me to go down the career that I have now. Um, and my mom, knowing that I was going to be here in front of all of you, said she will go toe-to-toe -to -toe with any high schooler. On the, okay. on the citizen, on the citizen <laughs> exam. So she would pass probably all 50 questions. Um, the Citizens League was formally incorporated in 1952 and up here on, on the screen and in your handouts is um, the charge that they had for themselves. But the history of the Citizens League goes, uh, it's actually started a decade before. It started in the 1940s when a group of concern business leaders and community leaders got together and formed the Good Government Group. And in your packets, I have a handout. Uh, on the occasion of the Citizens League 50th anniversary, we put out this bit of history. And so take a look at it. You might recognize some names in there. So this Good Government uh, Group got together, and I love this slogan that they had. Let's, st instead of beefing, let's act. Um, so through the 1940s, the Good Government Group convened regularly, and they wanted to effectively organize to compete with the many pressure groups, aggressively functioning on behalf of self-interest, to make effective and magnify the influence of individual members, all for the common good. There were similar Good Government Groups that popped up around St. Paul and Rochester, and the Citizens League first started, some of you may know, as the Minneapolis Citizens League. And it was due to Tom Swain and, I believe, uh, um, George Latimer that brought the Citizens League across the river. I love this picture here. It says, wanted a 1,000 citizens. 
This is an actual photo of a Citizens League event in the fall of 1957 at Centennial Plaza in Minneapolis. The idea to grow the small good government group to something bigger is said to have started from a 1951 sermon at Hennepin Methodist Church, then the largest Methodist congregation. In attendance that day was Stuart Leck, a construction company owner, whom some of you may know built the Roanoke Building, the Baker Building, and the old Memorial Stadium. Stuart would later become the first chair of the Citizens League. By this time, there was a highly engaged membership. Meetings were held in member homes throughout Minneapolis to invite neighbors to present the mission of the Citizens League, answer any questions members may have, and all of this for $5 membership dues. Committees such as the Membership Committee and Speakers Committee worked together to organize community meetings such as the one up here on the screen. These were all volunteers. None of them were paid. Here's a picture from Citizens League Archives. It's a debate in 1970 that included Minnesota Attorney General Douglas Head and future Governor Wendell Anderson. By the summer of 1952, the League had claimed over 1,000 members, and by 1953, over 2,200 members. The entire membership was invited to participate in all decisions on new projects and positions, the original study committee process, a process we still use today, was used to tackle issues such as transportation and taxes. These volunteers were smart. They understood government. They made it their entertainment. So some members, uh, these are, some members may recognize some of the photos here. Uh, these are the six uh, previous executive directors before I took the position. And um, we start off here with Ray Black on the top, uh, Vern C. Johnson, Ted Coldery, Kurt Johnson, Lyle Ray, and Sean Kershaw, who probably wishes I would not use this photo anymore. <laughs> this is how we make policy. We believe those who are most impacted should help define the problem. This takes everyday citizens to want to be engaged with us. We run a process that is open and transparent. We believe in data and that it should be evidence-based. And we believe in politically achievable, that is politically plausible solutions. It doesn't help our state and it doesn't help our communities to have great reports on a shelf. And we believe legislators, all of you, senators, help to make policies. But we also believe that everyone should and that policy exists everywhere, and that it should be the experts along with those who have the lived experiences. And again, people most impacted by a problem should be part of defining that problem and coming up with the solution. An example I like to use is when we talk about education policy, rarely do we have students and parents in the room. My own experience up at the Capitol when I first started my career here led me and others to create an internship program called the Capital Pathways Internship Program for college students. Here was our inaugural class in 2016, in 2017, in 2018, in 2019 last year, and this is the new cohort for this year. We started this internship program because we wanted young people to know the knowledge of the legislative process. We wanted them to start building relationships that they might need to further their career. And we wanted them to be exposed to other careers up at the Capitol and, and perhaps uh, uh, trigger them to think about careers they had not thought of. But they come to us with different levels of knowledge. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about the things that we are doing at the Citizens League to get them prepared for their internships. Like many who have said um, before already here today, some do not know the role of government. Here is a visual that we use in our training just to lay out what are the um, duties of federal government versus state government, and what are the joint powers shared by state and the federal government. 
We also talk about the three branches of government, and it is true. They do come to us not knowing this basic information. Similarly, we show them what is the difference between the three branches of the federal government versus the state government, and it's different. Some of you, all of you, should be very familiar with this legislative calendar. We try to make our training fun and engaging because we know that this is what's going to make them remember important milestones. So this legislative calendar, what we do is we make it interactive by cutting up these milestones and making them put it up chronologically. This is a game that we've done the last couple of years and it's made them remember key dates during the legislative session. We're really proud of this program. This is our five-year overview. Since 2016 through 2020, we will have, at the end of this session, 164 alumni representing, and they have all been placed in 65 different organizations. We call these host sites. And they rep represent from 11 to 13 colleges and universities around the state. We take students from both two and four year schools. These are the host organizations who have accepted these interns into their place of work. It is at these host organization sites that they get their hands-on experience. You will see many interns walking with their host sites um, around the Capitol this year. The ones in yellow are simply new host sites to our program. Where are they now? Many have taken on positions up here up at the Capitol. Some have gone on to work with nonprofits. Some have gone on to pursue further study and policies. And all of them have credited this program, Capital Pathways, as launching them into these positions, into these additional studies, and have said that if not for this program, they're not sure they would be in these roles. Here is a snapshot of the history of the Citizens League. Next week, we'll be celebrating our 68th birthday. Some of these accomplishments, many of you will know. 1960 brought us the Met Council. It was due to a Citizens League report in 67 that led to the creation of the Met Council. In 1970s, um, one major accomplishment was the commercial tax-based sharing program, fiscal disparities. And I project this image because all of, this, all of these accomplishments could not have happened without everyday citizens who knew how their government worked. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you for the history lesson and for the good work that you do. Uh, next, we have uh, Lisa Clark on, um, Lisa Larson, sorry, on the list. And if we could also have, um, well, Lisa, I'd like you to testify first, and then I'm going to get the next four up together. So, Lisa, welcome to the committee. Madam Chair, thank you so much. Uh, Madam Chair, members, my name is Lisa Larson. I am a member of the League of Women Voters of the White Bear Lake area, which encompasses a large part of the Northeast metropolitan area. If you could speak right into the mic, we want to hear you. Today, I am speaking on behalf of the Minnesota League of Women Voters. Until I retired, I was the Nonpartisan Education Council in the Minnesota House, and it's wonderful to be back, although I have to say it's more uncomfortable sitting here than there. Uh, my remarks are based on a 2018 study of civics education policy and practices uh, in the White Bear Lake area high schools. Uh, your committee administrator, Greg Marcus, was kind enough to make copies, and so anyone who is interested can find a copy of that study in the back of the room. There are three parts to my remarks, and I will be brief. The first part is why the League of Women Voters is interested in civics education. The second is what approach we used uh, to the case study, which is essentially what it is, that we undertook, and a few of the observations we made in the course of that study. And then finally, and uh, most relevant to uh, today, is how the study content and the civics education debate at the Capitol seem to overlap. Part one, why is the League interested in civics education? It's a critical concern to League members for the following reason. Democracy depends on citizens 
who actively and effectively participate in public life and political life. We must understand how democracy works and why it's important so we know what we can do and accomplish through civic action. It is a civics education that develops our understanding of democracy and motivates us to participate in our community and country. As your list of testifiers shows today, improving high school civics education deserves nonpartisan support across the political spectrum. Part two, to the content of the League Civics Education Study. In order to learn how White Bear Lake area educators develop students' knowledge of democracy and students' role as citizen, we interviewed administrators and civics teachers working in the local public high schools within the League uh, region. And we also interviewed other stakeholders, including legislators and um, uh, agency uh, individuals. At each school, we asked three questions. What does the school include in its government and citizenship curriculum? How well do students perform on district and state civics tests? And for us, most importantly, perhaps, whether, when, and how do students actively learn to participate in a democracy? Those interviews led to a number of observations, but I will only point out three of them because uh, of the time constraints. Uh, one of the observations was how districts allocate resources for civics instruction and courses varies, in part because there is no district or state accountability for complying with Minnesota's civic content standards and benchmarks. Two, government and citizenship course requirements vary by district. And three, and this uh, for me personally was very important, Schools emphasize preparing students for work and higher education much more than they emphasize preparing students for citizenship. There were another, a number of other observations that I thought were salient, but I will skip over them uh, in the interest of time. So part three, the three important points where our league study and the current civics education debate overlap. One, Minnesota's civics education debate is not about the content of its civic standards and benchmarks. The debate is about how to ensure all districts fully and effectively implement current state standards and benchmarks. And that, I think, is a critical point uh, because uh, in 2019, there were all kinds of issues uh, raised uh, that I think obscured uh, that reality. Two, and this is equally important, given just how fundamental and how critical civics education is to democracy, letting each district decide how to teach civics is not in the best interests of students or the state. And three, the last point, the statewide civics test and test data are a means to an end. They are not the end in and of itself. The civics test measures mastery of very basic facts. It does not measure students' ability to effectively engage in the affairs of their community and country, which in fact is the real goal of civics education. The reality is we pay attention to what we measure and report. Until Minnesota can ensure civics education in every district gives students the knowledge and skills they need to be effective and engaged citizens, gathering and reporting statewide civics test data tells us how much more we still must do to achieve that goal. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Larson. Uh, next, if Jennifer Bloom could come, and I also understand that Amy Anderson Heather and Ryan are also joining her. That's what that fourth chair is up there for. So if we could get all of you up to the table, please. 
Ms. Bloom, welcome to the committee. Introduce yourself for the record, please. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good afternoon, members of the committee. My name is Jennifer Bloom. I'm the Executive Director of the Learning Law and Democracy Foundation, and I am a member of the Minnesota Civic Education Coalition. We are going to applaud everything that has been said here and kind of shift your thinking to what has been done in schools. And I know Representative Erdahl said that it's a very difficult thing to figure this out. So a couple of years ago, we decided to try. And our attempt came from a document that was created quite a number of years ago that was a self-assessment that we shared with teachers and school personnel to help them see where they're maybe lacking in a best practice and they can start to craft their own better civics curriculum. Using that, we developed an online survey, and I'm gonna turn this over to Amy Anderson because she is real familiar with the data that we were able to, to uh, collect. Amy, welcome to the committee. Introduce yourself for the record, please. Thanks, my name is Amy Anderson, and I am at the uh, Department in Minnesota Civic Youth at the YMCA of the Greater Twin Cities. Also a member of the Minnesota Civic Education Coalition along with Jennifer. So as Jennifer pointed out, we actually took the data that has been uh, talked about by many people earlier today, best practices around civic education. And our goal was really to gather information on what was happening, um, both to kind of get at what uh, Representative Erdahl was looking at, but also to inform decisions you are making as well as the Department of Education. And so in gathering the information, it was a voluntary assessment. We did promotion through um, professional networks through the Minnesota Council of Social Studies teachers, um, through emails, through postcards and such, but it was voluntary, so that's important to note. There were three sections. The first one was how and when districts offer civics, government, or citizenship courses, as well as extracurricular programs that support civic education. The second section is focused on the Minnesota Civics Test, and the third was the inclusion of civic skills and benchmark standards in the courses that they taught. We received 86 responses, 62 completed the full survey. It was a very long survey, uh, which we knew going in, but uh, we wanted to get it as comprehensive as we could. We did limit it to one response per district, so that's essentially 62 districts that we heard from. And we are planning to repeat the survey this spring, so we're gonna continue to gather more information. Um, key findings. The majority of districts offer civics, government, or citizenship courses in ninth or 12th grade, which is consistent with what we've heard. What's probably worth noting is that we also had responses that some are in 10th grade and some are in 11th grade. So again, consistent with what we've heard, um, there are very little standardizations of when it is offered. However, ninth and 12th are the most common. The majority of those courses are required and are one semester long. The majority of districts do not incorporate civics or government themes into other required courses. It's limited to the courses in civics, government, or citizenship that they offer. And civic extracurricular activities are not widely offered, we heard from the majority of the respondents. In regards to the civics test, most of the Minnesota uh, respondents offer the civics test as part of their civics or government classes. It is often given at the end of the term. It is often, most often given as all 50 questions. Some do a pre and post test, but most of the learning is done through just normal classroom lessons. There is a special preparation. Um, the results, as you've heard, uh, recorded, a uh, majority of recorded in their course grade books. We did get some that recorded at the district or school level, but very few of those are happening. It's mostly by teacher in their grade books. Um, the good news, approximately three-fourths of the respondents report that 75 to 100 percent of their students passed the test. We did not ask anything about how many times the test was given or exactly how that was you know, in, in relation to preparation, but um, the majority did say that 75 to 100 percent of the students did pass. In regards to the civic education standards, the majority of districts reported that content from the citizenship and government standards are taught at a significant or very significant level in their courses. Civic skills are taught with high or moderate participation in their civics, government, or citizenship courses. 
and the most popular civic education strategies include mock elections, discussing current events, watching and discussing content-related videos, reading primary sources as well as newspapers, magazines, and online articles. So that is very, very high level. Um, again, we sort of have a, a fair amount of data, but we wanted to sort of give a snapshot of what we saw happening, and we'll continue to gather this information as a source of, uh, of information for you and others. Thank you for sharing the information with us. It's always good to know where we are and what we're doing. Um, Heather, did you have some comments? Welcome to the committee. Thank you, Madam Chair. My name is, and members of the committee, my name is Heather Lushke. I am a civics, social studies, American history teacher in Cannon Falls. I've been teaching for 23 years, and I've been teaching civics for 23 years. I also hold a master's degree in education, a master's degree in American history and government, and I have a BA degree in history. I am the 2018 Minnesota Council Social Studies Teacher of the Year, 2018 Gilder Lerman, Minnesota Teacher of the Year, and I am the 2010 James Madison Fellow for the State of Minnesota. I have taught civics at both a semester, and I've taught civics both for a year long. And I can tell you without a doubt that I could not and would not be able to do what I do if I did not have civics for a full year. I am fortunate to not only have ninth graders for a full year, but to also get some of them back for a full year in my advanced placement U.S. government and politics class. In the past 11 years, my AP kids have won the Minnesota State We the People competition and have represented the state of Minnesota in Washington, D.C., competed against the state winners from across the nation. I can tell you that I am able to do what I can do with my kids because they have a full year of ninth grade and a full year of 12th grade AP US government. My students know the three branches of government. They know citizens' duties, rights, and responsibilities. My ninth graders currently this week are studying Wisconsin versus Yoder and doing a moot court. We are currently looking at topics like hate speech. My students also spend time taking a look at how bills become law. My AP government kids can talk about policy. They understand what's currently going on with regard to our political scene. And they can talk about things such as strict scrutiny, which most Americans do not understand. I'm here to testify in front of you for something that I'm very, very passionate about, and that's civic education. I believe that it should be required in school. I believe that it should be a full, long, full year long class. My students take the citizenship test as a final. For the past five years, we've had an 85% pass rate. My AP government kids have a 73% pass rate on the AP exam. The state of Minnesota's pass rate is 63%, and the national pass rate is 58%. Again, I attribute all of this to being able to have the time with these students for two full long years. And at this time, I'd like to introduce you to one of my students. Welcome to the committee. Introduce yourself for the record, please. And just swallow that mic. Get real close <laughs> to that mic. My name is Ryan Schlichting, and I'm a student at Cannon Falls High School. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and, uh, Mrs. Chair, sorry, and members of the committee. I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for the civics education that I received at the hands of this wonderful teacher next to me. Um, I am one of those AP government students that she was talking about, and I can say without a doubt that if we had to fit that into one semester, I'm, I'm pretty sure my head would explode. Um, we cover 15 required cases, including cases such as McCulloch versus Maryland, Marbury versus Madison, and others including U.S. Um, versus New York Times Company. Uh, we go wide field. We cover everything from caucuses to conventions to primaries. We talk about the candidate process. Really, we get a deep understanding of what our government is and how it works. And in our civics class, we also get deep understandings of what our rights, responsibilities, and duties are as citizens of the United States. And I'd like to touch on something that I think is pretty well ignored in our, in our state today, and that is extracurricular, extracurricular civic activities. 
Um, she mentioned that we have been the WIPO champions in Cannon Falls for the past 11 years. And what WIPO is, is it's a competition and it's called We the People. And we debate on constitutionalism and constitutional law. Uh, the units that I'm on include the basic political thought that founded the United States and the Constitutional Convention. Because of this, I've read works like Spirit of the Laws, I've read Democracy in America by Alex Tocqueville, and I've also been working on reading the Federalist Papers. This has provided me an understanding of civics and our government that I would have not even imagined before I became involved in an extracurricular like WIPO. And so because of this, I would highly recommend you to um, suggest for extracurriculars to become more wide varied and more available around the state. Because if there's one thing that I believe in, it's that education is meant to build the people of tomorrow. And if you are ignoring citizens, you're not building good citizens for the future, you're just building good workers. So I would once again encourage you to please continue your support for civic education. Ryan, thank you for those um, wonderful comments and an example of a great teacher with passion who is in, who is practicing her craft and producing a legacy. So I just uh, commend you uh, for your teaching and uh, for your great success. And you also bring the point. You know how well your students are doing because you have some metrics. And we don't have those metrics across the state when it comes to how are our students doing on something as basic as our civics test. So uh, thank you. Thank you for bringing that. And I believe there might be a couple questions uh, for these witnesses at the table. And let's, let us welcome uh, Representative Scott, if you can introduce yourself for the committee, and then ask your question. Sure, thank you, Madam Sp um, Chair, for letting me speak at your, um, at your um, Senate committee hearing. And um, I'm Representative Peggy Scott. I represent Andover, Northern Coon Rapids, and one precinct in the city of Ramsey. And I, uh, I know this young man, and I know his family. Um, I, we went to college together with his, with his dad. And uh, he's, I, told, I was texting his dad and videotaped you a little bit there, Ryan. But um, I told him also that his parents were the, teacher, or the parents of the year, but I think his teacher gets teacher of the year, too. And, it um, takes both. It does. It does. So I, just really impressive. And um, thank you for being a great teacher. Um, and making this a priority and be enthusiastic about it. I think that's half of the game with this subject as a teacher that engages the students. So thank you. And welcome, Representative Scott. Also, uh, Senator Swadzinski, I think you weren't here when we introduced, so if you would kindly introduce yourself for the committee and the, the members. <clears throat> Sorry, a little aggressive on the mic. Um, my, my name is Senator um, Steve Swadzinski, sorry for being late, and, um, but this is maybe the most amazing hour and a half of my life, um, and I can't thank everybody enough for all, of, all of the efforts and that you put into the testimony today, so thank you all for being here. Thank you, and, and also we have Senator Jasinski. You guys always give this difficult thing to me. I get these two names sometimes combined, but Senator Jasinski, welcome, and if you could introduce yourself for the... I was here when the be meeting began. I just wanted to make sure you knew that. I, I have been here the whole meeting. So I, I hadn't heard you like, laugh. I think that oh, okay. was the thing. Senator Dames, though, I believe, joined in the middle of the meeting. So I'm going to give Senator it over to Dames. him. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, thank you, folks, for being here. I'm Senator Gary Dames uh, from southern Minnesota. We appreciate what all you folks are doing and appreciate the information. And I apologize for getting in late. I was in another meeting. Thank you, Senator Dames. We do have some more testifiers, but I do want to uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, next, we have uh, Amy Wallstein, Mark Ritchie. Ms. Wallstein, welcome to the committee. Introduce yourself for the record, please. Um. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and members. My name is Amy Wallstein. I am with the Minnesota Business Partnership. Um, we are a trade association representing Minnesota's largest companies, and our m members do believe in building um, great workers and great citizens, because it's more important than ever that we ensure Americans have the knowledge and skills to participate in civic life. Informed and active citizens make for a stronger country, a stronger economy, and a stronger workforce. This is essential for Minnesota's continued economic growth. 
The Minnesota, or the U.S. Chamber Foundation recently commissioned a Harvard Business Review white paper that examines the state of civics and why improving it through education is so important. It's a great report, um, and I'll just share three main points from that report. First, collaboration and other 21st century skills are needed in the workplace to foster the respectful behavior that is practiced through civil discourse, collaboration, and compromise. Second, the report found that business success is built on the bringing together of people from diverse backgrounds to work together to advance shared goals and outcomes. Third, there is strong need for businesses, nonprofit foundations, and educational institutions to provide more experiential ways to teach civics as a supplement to teachers' efforts in the classroom, which we've heard in previous testimony. Overall, we, we believe the reason civics education is important to the workplace is because there is considerable overlap between the skills acquired as part of civic learning and the skills required in employment. Current and future work increasingly requires that employees have a knowledge of economic and political process, skill in understanding presentations in a wide range of media, the ability to work cooperatively with others, especially those from diverse backgrounds, and the ability to engage in discussion that leads to innovative and effective civic action in the community. Um, it, and that's really important because businesses are increasingly embracing their role in creating deeper linkages between their companies, their employees, and their communities. So in conclusion, um, the benefits of a quality civics education gives young people the knowledge and skills to be successful citizens, which is highly valued by employers now more than ever. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I want to say secretary, but Mr. Ritchie, welcome to the committee. Introduce yourself for the table. Thank place. you, Madam Chair. My name is Mark Ritchie, and I'm president of Global Minnesota. Madam Chair and members of the committee, in uh, keeping with the Chairwoman's desire to really be on time, I'm going to limit my comments to just a minute and a half. I trained to be a high school social study teacher, like my friend Representative Erdahl. And my most favorite professor drilled into our heads, she would say, almost every day as we came to class, a little bit tired and not really focused, our job, was be, our job as a teacher was preparing young people for the office of citizen. And that notion that we're preparing young people to be an active citizen, an informed citizen, all that you've heard today summarizes that point. This has been, has been an amazing afternoon, and I'm so grateful to have been here to observe and to be part of this, and to have my heart full from hearing from everyone. I want to make one promise and one plea. The promise is if you pass this bill, and we have data that says how a district has done in terms of passing on these tests, I will take on the job of getting that word out to parents and students and companies and people who actually care. And I know they care because many of our sponsors, our financial supporters, our largest companies, we work with them to go into classrooms because they know that there's certain kind of education that's not getting across that affects the workforce and affects many things. So if you get the data, we're going to make it competitive around the state and districts will start to compete with each other to get their graduation or their success rate up because parents and students and others will care. Here's my plea. We're approaching quickly the nation's 250th birthday. Other states around the country have been creating commissions, the things that are needed to do to be part of the national. We have an opportunity, if we get on this, to be part of the national celebration of this amazing 250-year history of our amazing country. But the legislature needs to act. But within that action, we also need to use it to seize those other opportunities in the civic sphere. When Senator Dill retired, we had had many conversations and frustrations about how we could not have moved further with our character education part of civic education. And I could remember saying, Mark, keep on that. I haven't. But you know, if we talk about the nation's 250th birthday, we could start talking about character education and ethics in our civics world. We also have opportunities in our state because we have things that link us back throughout those 250 years 
and forward. So in the world of getting the next thing done, getting these numbers out of our schools and using those to build competition so that people want to look better, that's important. But with the nation's 250th coming up, we have an opportunity to take civic education, character education, ethics education, nation building right here at home through our history and forward. We have a chance to really lead the nation as Minnesota should. Please, if I can be of assistance to helping make that come to pass, if I can be of assistance when that data is available, Global Minnesota stands ready to help and be part of the process. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Ritchie. I'm gonna take you up on that offer. Yes, um, ma'am. The uh, draft legislation is in your packets. So we are ready to go with this, and uh, it will certainly take uh, everybody's help, but it's incredibly important. So thank you so much. Uh, we have... Um, one testifier, uh, we're going to ask Rep. Erdahl to do two things briefly. Uh, one, I'd like him to share comments from Mitch Perlstein, who was not able to attend today, but he did send uh, some brief written comments. And then um, after that, if I could have, uh, I know Representative Erdahl, I'd like you to uh, be our last testifier. And then we'll have a few comments from those at the table here. Representative Erdahl. Madam Chair. Uh, from Mitch uh, Perlstein. At the risk of resume reading, I've held several jobs over the years pertinent to the subject at hand in education, government, and journalism, including special assistant for policy and communications to Governor Al Qui, as an official of the U.S. Department of Education, as an editorial writer for the Pioneer Press, and as founder of the Center of the American Experiment. Of academic relevance, I hold a PhD in educational administration from the University of Minnesota. But my starting point in talking about civics education this afternoon predates all of that, going back to the most difficult days of Vietnam a half century ago. Back then, I began describing great numbers of fellow young people as naive cynics, a seeming contradiction in terms. How could one be naive and cynical at the same time? But they were in the sense they had come to think of dreadful things about the United States when they had only slim and skewed knowledge about their country. It's one thing to be cynical and sour when you're old and jaundiced. It's another thing when you're young and have yet to traipse even a quarter of the way around the block. My aim for civics education is to reduce naive cynicism among students by giving them a fuller understanding of governmental and other rudiments of our nation not a partisan or a storybook understanding, but as accurate and balanced a grasp as possible. One that takes straightforward account of our past sins and current shortcomings, of which there were are many, but also makes it clear that the United States animating idea has always been worthy of respect and remains so. And that for a nation of a third of a billion diverse souls, all kinds of things work better than routinely advertised. Most specifically, despite polarizing troubles among a multitude of groups, interests, and factions, we get along better with each other as human beings, as fellow Americans, than we routinely give ourselves credit for. Many students, of course, will be untouched and unpersuaded by what I'm talking about. And if they are latter-day naive cynics upon entering a civics class or program, they may well leave that way. But at least educators and grown-ups who have made it farther around all kinds of blocks will have tried. That, Thank you. That concludes. And for your comments, Rep. Well, Erdahl. From Pearlstein to Erdahl. First of all, I'd like to thank uh, you, Madam Chair, for having this, uh, this hearing today and, and for the members and, uh, who have attended, the staff who has worked on this, uh, for those who have testified, for those who have come here because of some other interest in what we're doing, uh, I'm very grateful for that. Um, one way of showing some gratitude, uh, upstairs in room uh, 2308, uh, there are cookies and, and coffee, which I purchased. <laughs> I want you, please, all of you, go up and take some cookies. I do not want to take dozens of cookies home. So upon the conclusion of this, please, you don't even have to stay. Just take some cookies. Now, in our state and across our country, 
sentiment is growing to improve civics education. Once a foundation of our school curriculum, it now has become minimized in too many of our school districts. Some of our Minnesota schools, as evidenced by testimony here from Cannon Falls, do just an excellent job in teaching civics, and I commend them. Some do a mediocre job, and frankly, some maybe not much at all. We don't know. According to the National Assessment of Education Progress, 75% of our students are not proficient in civics knowledge upon graduation. Now, for our Minnesota schools, uh, Senator Nelson and I have offered proposals to make civics, and Senator Swadzinski as well, uh, to make uh, civics education more consistent, effective, and relevant. We've had some mixed success legislatively. Um, there are things that maybe can be done without statute. Uh, this this year, 2020, uh, there will be a uh, revision or a, or a uh, possible revision of standards uh, of social studies through the Minnesota Department of Education. Some of the things that have been discussed here today uh, can appropriately be dealt with uh, through the revision process of the department. But I'd like to focus on a bill today that uh, probably wouldn't be part of the standards in that way. A few years ago, we, we passed into law a provision requiring that Minnesota students must take a civics test based on 50 questions from the naturalization test that is taken by immigrants wishing to become citizens. And uh, the uh, testifiers uh, did note that just a, a little bit ago. Now, this is not a high stakes test in the model of math and reading. No scores are reported to the state. I believe that at least, at the very least, Schools should be required to report an aggregate. How many took the test? How many passed the test? It seems reasonable to me that if we assert that a test be taken, we at least should receive some measure of accountability. We can't even be certain that all schools are complying with the civics test statute unless the results are reported. If an aggregate score is required, I believe that our goal of consistency, effectiveness, and relevance will be established. The test is not relevant to students if they know it is not valued enough to score. By ensuring accountability, the test becomes meaningful, meaningful and effective teaching and consistency follow. It's not too much to ask, and it should be easy to administer. Now, I've heard a lot about the strain that this could put on some of our school districts and how bearing the cost would be burdensome. Well, I don't believe it is too complicated or expensive for a teacher who gives the test to report to a curriculum direct coordinator or a superintendent how many took the test, how many passed the test, and for that person to send the report to a portal designed for the Department of Education. You just press the send button, the results go in and it's tabulated. I just don't see that that is a, a real valid barrier to getting this done. And I believe it's an easy step to bring relevancy back to civics. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Representative Erdahl. And I thank all of you for your time, investment today, and your investment in youth, our future, and as uh, Rep. Erdahl mentioned, for the uh, committee staff who've made this possible, and I commend the members who are here. Uh, we had uh, nine members here in and out today, and sometimes that doesn't happen even during session. I think it shows uh, how important this topic is. I do want to say I am reminded of the our grounding statement, which uh, is on the, on the front of every agenda. Uh, that this committee puts out, and I hope you have that as well, because many of you mentioned this, and I think it's important to just get it on the record one more time. We've had a bit of an interim here. We haven't had uh, committee meetings for a while, but um, our, our committee focuses on students. We fund what works. Education is the great equalizer in a significant sense. Education is the moral, racial, and economic issue of our day. We will focus state resources on providing opportunities for all Minnesota students to receive an education that prepares them for the jobs of tomorrow by using proven incentives and promising innovations that achieve better results. One of those must be civically engaged 
and relevant students who can go out and shape their government. That's what civics is all about. And I want to thank all of you for um, working towards this goal. A note that uh, this legislation will be jacketed and introduced on the first day of session. Again, uh, it's very simple. If you don't measure something, how do you know if it's happening? Uh, and so this reporting will shine a light of accountability on schools and it will help administrators, legislators, and families determine what improvements need to be made to ensure that all of our graduates are prepared and ready for the responsibility of representative government. It is a responsibility. And as educators and leaders in this state, it is our responsibility to make sure that our students are prepared to take on that heavyweight but great opportunity of representative democracy. So again, I thank you all for coming. I should see if there are any other members who want to make some comments. Senator Clausen. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I apologize. I had a meeting with about 15 constituents about a deed issue, so I didn't hear a lot of the testimony, but I would like to make two points. And Representative Ertl made a good point that the social studies uh, curriculum in the state of Minnesota is being evaluated now, and this is a great place that this should fit right in there. The second thing is, uh, the citizenship test, it's a factoid test. Really, it's like a trivial pursuit test. It really doesn't do anything to make more responsible or engaged citizens. And I'd really like to see part of this review through the State uh, Department of Education. They look at how can we really get down to the facts of making engaged citizens, informed citizens, rather than giving them a factoid test of testing their trivia. So thank you, Madam Chair. I do believe the test is the base, not is the floor, uh, certainly not the ceiling. We would expect more. Yes. Any other comments? Uh, Senator Swadzinski. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you again, Madam Chair, for conducting this meeting today, and thank you, Representative Erdahl. I'm not going to talk for more than a minute because everybody in this room and everybody in this committee has heard me preach this for three years now, but I just think it's imperative that the class is offered in 11th and 12th grade and not 9th and 10th grade. Kids are signing up for selective service, they're paying for their first income taxes, they're, they're, um, they're getting their driver's licenses in the 9th grade. It's a million years away, but in 11th and 12th grade, it's immediate. They, they get it. And I think, uh, I, I don't disagree necessarily or agree with what Senator Claussen just said. The test is a trivial pursuit type test, but nonetheless, I agree also with what Madam Chair said, because it, it is the base. And if we expect, if we make the naturalized citizens take this test, it doesn't seem unreasonable that we would expect that same test to be given and administered to our native-born citizens. And so I'm pretty open-minded to that testing, but my favorite days in those classrooms were when a kid would say, what about my rights? And I would pause and I'd say, what are about your responsibilities? And that's what I want this class to be all about, is teaching those kids that civic meetings aren't for old people, writing letters to representatives isn't something old people do, coming to the state capitol on a tour isn't something old people do. And if we're going to ignite the youth of this country to revolutionize the status quo and turn this country into the hopes and dreams that our forefathers dreamed about, let's get these kids taking an American government class to graduate from high school. Loud act to follow. I can't follow that. <laughs> okay. um, yes. You can. Thank, thank you, Madam Chair, for holding the hearing. And uh, I was particularly pleased, too, to have the League of Women Voters uh, with a survey in my own district. And uh, it has a lot of very good information. Um, I wouldn't necessarily characterize the test as trivial. I mean, it's recitation of facts. That's what tests do. And we, in world's best workforce, we, you know, there's tests for measuring and there's areas we can improve on. That'll always be the case, but it's a base. And in terms of the active engagement, uh, that is really what we ultimately want to see. So uh, we'll look forward to getting additional testimony on it. Uh, I 
I think, Ryan, uh, your, your point was really good. A uh, reminder that it's, it's not only preparing the world's best workforce, but it's citizenship as well. And that's an expectation, a deliverable that should be a part of that diploma. And if we say it and we mean it and the public has asked for this, uh, then we need feedback. After all, there's $19 billion that we're investing and having this part uh, for feedback will help us. Thank you. Uh, well, any, I see no further comments. Uh, let me remind you, you're all invited up for coffee, conversation, cookies, lemonade up on the second floor, room 2308. Uh, I'm hoping to get a picture with uh, Mr. Ryan, an example of what we want to see with all of our students. So uh, this meeting is adjourned.